This is a short video on three intracellular bacteria that can infect the lungs. We're going to be talking about Mycobacterium tuberculosis, Legionella pneumophilia, and Chlamydia pneumonia. And uh, we're going to be talking about these categories that are listed across the top here for each of these three species. So let's get started with MTB, Mycobacterium tuberculosis. MTB replicates inside the macrophages of the lungs. It's a facultative intracellular bacteria. This means that it can grow in vitro. Um, it's usually much better at growing in uh, natural macrophages. So it has like a, about a generation time of, of a couple days, could take up to a week to grow a culture of it uh, in culture, which is much longer generation time than, than E. coli, for instance. So we say it's a facultative intracellular bacteria. MTB stains with the acid fast stain, and this stain specifically stains the mycolic acid that's in the cell, cell membrane of Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Mycolic acid is a thick, waxy coat. Epidemiology of Mycobacterium, we have that HIV and other conditions of immunosuppression are major risk factors. This is especially true for MTB. There's a big association between TB and people with HIV. People with HIV are much more likely to get TB, which is already pretty prevalent around the world. And uh, so that's why it's mentioned here. But, but really, you could say that HIV and other immunosuppressed conditions are major risk factors for any of these bacteria. Tuberculosis is a problem because it's transmitted through aerosol droplet nuclei. Droplet nuclei are smaller than droplets, and therefore Mycobacterium tuberculosis requires airborne precautions. Now the immune response, the pathogenesis and the pathology for MTB. MTB causes chronic pneumonia. So a person comes in with chest cold symptoms and hemoptysis. They're coughing up blood. They get night sweats. They get weight loss. And there's uh, most of these symptoms are usually caused by the immune's host response. There's a couple stages for tuberculosis. There's a primary stage. It can go into a latent phase where the, where the body is, is really kind of isolating the tuberculosis. And then that Isolated tuberculosis can then reactivate. There's a couple reasons why a latent stage mycobacterium tuberculosis would reactivate, and uh, that could be by immunosuppression. If a patient starts taking a new drug that suppresses the immune system, or if the patient gets reinfected with more bacteria. Now, normally the infection is controlled in the body, such as in the latent stage, by the CD4 and CD8 T cells, with interferon gamma being one of the major cytokines initiating this, this containment, and macrophages are also helping too. They form granulomas around the, around the bacteria, and, uh, and that kind of keeps it contained. People with HIV who have tuberculosis can get miliary TB, which is an awful diffuse spread of tuberculosis. Um, you got to look up chest x-ray images of miliary TB. It looks like millet seeds spread across the lungs. It's a very diffuse pattern. Um, definitely an atypical presentation for tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is usually diagnosed with a PPD skin test. The skin test tests the type 4 hypersensitivity reaction of tuberculosis, and uh, this skin test is not perfect. People who are HIV plus might get a false result on the skin test because they are immunosuppressed, and they're not able to have the immune response that would make the PPD skin test positive. So even if they do have TB, you might not see it. People who have had the BCG vaccine also get false responses on the PPD skin test. There are a couple other ways to diagnose tuberculosis, sputum culture, pretty hit and miss. There's a blood test that specifically tests the body's response for interferon gamma. That's called the quantiferon test. And lastly is the expert PCR test, which not only tests for mycobacterium tuberculosis uh, present in, in the, uh, based, on, based on the genomics of the bacterium, but it also tests for resistance to rifamycin, which is one of the bacteria used to treat tuberculosis. And speaking of treating tuberculosis, the first line antibiotics make the acronym RIPE, R-I-P-E. That's uh, four antibiotics that are used to treat mycobacterium tuberculosis, often used with each other, if not all four at the same time. There's also a vaccine of 
uh, for tuberculosis made from a bovine strain, M. bovis, and this really has variable efficacy. I believe the papers say something like 80 or 0 to 80% efficacy, so it really, really just varies uh, for this vaccine. Definitely not a guarantee. And we have a couple associated bacterium here, um, specifically non-tuberculosis mycobacterium, uh, which is a which is a different mycobacteria and that is not spread person to person. There's also a mycobacterium that causes leprosy. There's a typical and an atypical variant of that as well. That's probably worth looking into. All right. Next, we're going to talk about Legionella pneumophilia. Let's start with the replication location. Again, this is replicating in human macrophages, and it's another facultative bacteria. This means that it can, again, survive in vitro, but it's much, much better at living in the body, intracellularly, in the human macrophages. Legionella is unique in that it can also survive outside of the human body um, in the environment, usually in water. So there could be water contaminated with Legionella, and we'll talk about that uh, in transmission a bit more. And it, when Legionella is surviving in the water, it's actually in amoeba, so it's still intracellular when it's in the environment. Legionella is gram-negative, although it is hard to stain gram-negative because it's usually intracellular. Epidemiology. Legionella is an opportunistic infection. Things that put you at risk for this are being older, as, uh, as your immune system dwindles with age, smoking, COPD, and of course immunosuppression. So as we said earlier, Legionella can be spread by contaminated water, typically not spread person to person directly. But if Legionella is present, such as in an, in an amoeba, in contaminated water, and somebody consumes that water, they could then have a Legionella infection. Legionella, unlike TB, causes an acute pneumonia, more of a quick onset pneumonia. Um, it was first described uh, in a group of older gentlemen that were that were together inside indoors, um, and it's it was thus called it was thus named after the Legionnaires. It was called Legionnaires' disease. Legionella is particularly hard to diagnose. It does not stain well, and it requires a specialized auger to grow it in the lab. Legionella does have a decent treatment. We treat it with macrolides, which are 50S ribosomal subunit inhibitors. Two examples of these drugs are clarithromycin and azithromycin. And one associated bug, actually the exact same bug, Legionella pneumophilia, also causes Pontiac fever, which has more flu-like symptoms. And it's not necessarily an infection of the, of the lower respiratory system, not an infection of the lungs, more of the upper respiratory system called Pontiac fever. And lastly, we have chlamydia pneumonia here. And that is another intracellular bacteria. This one is an obligate to intracellular, meaning that it must grow inside, in this case, the macrophages and the epithelial cells of the human body. This is another gram-negative one. Chlamydia has a high rate of carriers that do not have symptoms, which can, of course, aid in its transmission if a lot of people are infected with chlamydia but are not showing symptoms. Chlamydia uh, is also spread through the air in respiratory droplets. These are, as I said earlier, larger than aerosol droplets. So the little, the little air or the little beads of water in the air that carry chlamydia are larger than those that carry TB, but it still requires droplet precautions, that which are less stringent than the airborne precautions for TB. Chlamydia pneumonia causes walking pneumonia, which is a chronic condition, but it's less severe. The general lifestyle, the life cycle of chlamydia has two stages. There are elementary bodies, which are infectious, but do not do any kind of metabolism. And there are reticulate bodies, which have metabolism, but are not infectious. So it's easy to remember because it is uh, infectious first and then metabolism. Chlamydia is an intracellular obligate that must infect and then can proceed with metabolism. When chlamydia does infect a human cell, it modifies the phagosomal membrane into what is called an inclusion body and survives in there. Chlamydia is also hard to diagnose. There is a lack of standardized tests, and it slightly resembles tuberculosis. Chlamydia has a treatment. It's treated with doxycycline, which is a tetracycline, a 30S protein inhibitor, and uh, that that bacteria, or excuse me, that antibiotic is specifically effective because doxycycline accumulates inside the host cells, and chlamydia is an intracellular obligate bacteria.
And lastly, this chlamydia pneumonia is related to another chlamydia that is an STD and yet another chlamydia that is only present in animals. This is it for this list of intracellular bacteria that infect the lungs. Thanks for listening.